Well, good morning, church family. Thank you for joining us online today. As you know, we've had to take some precautions within the church, and so uh, we did not meet in person today, uh, but we're so thankful that you've joined us online. And I'm going to be preaching to you this morning from the book of Acts chapter number 4, if you'd like to find your way there. Acts chapter number 4. And I want to preach to you this morning on the subject of what makes a great church. What makes a great church? Church And, of course, the church in Jerusalem uh, recorded for us in the early uh, chapters of the book of Acts uh, was a great church. It's a church that we look at today and pattern many things after. It's a church that we learn from. It's a church that really can challenge the modern church today. And I believe if Calvary Baptist Church here in Benson is going to be a great church, uh, that we have to follow some things that this great church did. Now, I do believe that, that uh, this church is a great church. I believe God's got big plans for us in the Benson area. I believe that God has got, uh, given us the ability and the, and the uh, vision to, uh, to reach out into our community, and we're so thankful for that. But I think it has many more big things to come. And so as you look at the topic of what makes a great church, I want to draw your attention to Acts chapter 4 this morning. And I'm going to read you just three verses, 31 through 33. The Bible says this, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them aught of the things uh, which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we love you today. We thank you that you're a good God. We thank you that uh, you are in control no matter what our circumstances might say. We're thankful that you are the God of the universe, and uh, you know exactly what you're doing, when you're doing, and how to do it, and how to accomplish it. We're thankful for that today. And Father, we're thankful for the privilege we have to at least meet online and uh, to uh, preach your word and share it with with God's people here uh, via Facebook and YouTube. And uh, Lord, we're so grateful for these platforms that we can use uh, to continue to spread the word of God. And we pray that you'll bless our church family today, those that are down sick, uh, those that uh, uh, maybe uh, have some other issues going on in their lives. Lord, we pray that you'll touch each one of them. We pray now that you'll bless the preaching and the, and the message this morning. May it be encouraging and helpful to each of us. May it challenge us uh, to grow with you, to walk with you even greater. And may you give us a good, or a great church, I pray, uh, this morning here in Benson, Lord, at Calvary Baptist Church. We pray. We love you. We thank you again for all that you do. Bless this time now together. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Again, I uh, I want to talk to you on the topic of what makes a great church. You might have some different opinions on that today. Some people might think, well, if there's a lot of people in the church, it's a big church, that's a great church. Uh, some people think, no, a, a smaller church who, who, who does a lot or, or who are out there doing a lot in the community and reaching people, that's a great church. Uh, some people think, well, my, my laid back country church That's a great church. Or uh, my church is all family oriented and that's a great church. I think there's a lot of opinions. Uh, I have a lot of uh, ministries in the church. That makes it a great church. Well, I think if we really want to look at this topic, we do have to go to Scripture. When we look in Acts chapter uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, keep going. And we see the church at Jerusalem. uh, And and we see a God-given example of how to be a great church. Uh, I see a lot of churches today as you look around and if you visited churches and that type of thing, uh, you see a lot of churches today that are dead and dry, they're stale. Uh, you see a lot of churches today that are worldly and have compromised. You see a lot of churches today that never preach on sin. Uh, you see a lot of churches today that, that never challenge the believer, it's just you know make you feel good. I think we need churches today that challenge us, that push us, that promote the Savior, that do preach on sin, uh, that, 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 that tell us that God punishes sin. I think we need churches today that are alive. I think we need churches today that are on fire. We need churches today that, that are vibrant and passionate about serving God. I think we need churches today that are real, that they're in touch with people, and they're in touch with God, and they're excited about what God is doing in their lives. Thus, they're excited about what God can do in the lives of other people. So this morning I want to give you some ingredients the church at Jerusalem had and see what we need to be a great church. Number one, number one, this church had a great purpose. They had a great purpose. They were there for a reason. Uh, there was a purpose for the church at Jerusalem. Of course, there's a purpose for the church today. And if we'll per- make our purpose the same purpose that they had, we too can be a great church. Let's look at their purpose this morning. It was threefold. Number one, their purpose was to obey the Savior. It was to obey the Savior. Uh, Obedience uh, is linked to God's power 
and obedience is linked to God's blessing. The church at Jerusalem was simply obeying the Savior. In Luke chapter 24, they're told, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, they, they're obedient to Christ. They're obedient. Uh, when we obey the Savior, that's when we can truly experience the power of God in our personal lives, in our families, but also in our church. The purpose of the church is not to make a name for itself. The purpose of the church is to point people to the Savior. How do we do that? We do it, first of all, by being obedient in our own lives. Obey the Savior was the first part of their great purpose. Number two, uh, the second part of their great purpose was to obtain the promise. They were to obtain the promise. Acts chapter 1 verse number 8 says, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You see, that promise was given to the believers at the church. That promise was given to this new church and told, Hey, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall receive power. Uh, So their, their purpose was to obtain the promise that was given to them, which was to obtain the power of God. How are they going to do that? By the Holy Ghost. By the Holy Spirit. That power is not going to come from within. That power is not going to come from their secret society or their, their group of meetings. That power was going to come from the Holy Spirit. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall receive power. So their great purpose was to obey the Savior. It was to obtain the promise. And thirdly, it was to offer the gospel. It was to offer the gospel. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We read the first part of it. The last part of it says, uh, Be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, think about this. When Pentecost was preached and Peter stood before that great congregation and he preached uh, Christ to them. Uh, 3,000 people were saved and added to the church. What did he preach? He didn't preach his popular opinion. He didn't preach, hey, here's, here's my pet peeves. He didn't preach, hey, here's my philosophy. Peter stood before the crowd and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he preached Christ and he offered the gospel, people responded to that. Folks, let me just say this morning, the purpose of the church has to be a great purpose. And that great purpose is not building bigger buildings or or, or having more ministries or having a name in the community necessarily. All those things aren't wrong. The purpose of the church, if it's going to be a great church with a great purpose, has to be to obey the Savior, to obtain the promise, and to to absolutely, 100%, offer the gospel. That's why we're here. Folks, we've got the best news on planet earth. Jesus saves. He died. He was buried. He rose again three days later. That's the news we have to share. That's the gospel of Christ. And church, I just want to challenge you this morning. Offer the gospel. That's the purpose of the church. This church was great. Our church can be great today if number one, we'll have a great purpose. Number two, number two, they had great preaching they had great preaching. Now, Calvary Baptist Church, I hate to uh, be the bearer of bad news this morning, but uh, uh, you may not always get great preaching. <laughs> Amen. I try. I do my best, but I, I don't put myself on a, on a list of top ten preachers in the, in the nation or anything like that. Uh, I, I just do what God's laid on my heart, and I preach with passion, and I try to tell you what God has laid uh, on my heart and share with that with you. Uh, you don't have a great preacher. Uh, but let me tell you something. Uh, Peter wasn't necessarily a great preacher. Peter was an ordinary man. But God took that ordinary man and did some extraordinary things when he preached the gospel. You see, you don't have to be a good orator. You don't have to be good looking. You don't have to be loud. You don't have to be a storyteller. You don't have to be an attention keeper. You don't have to always come up with creative new things. See, here's the thing. You don't have to be a good preacher to get good preaching. Does that make sense? You don't have to be a great great preacher to get great preaching. Because here's the thing. When we preach properly... The word of God, it's always great preaching. But this church at Jerusalem had great preaching. And folks, if we want to have a great church here at Calvary Baptist Church in Benson, Arizona, we have to have great preaching. You say, well, how does that happen, Pastor? Because you're not good looking and you're not a good orator and you're, and you're not a great storyteller. and You don't always keep our attention. So how is it possible with, with you? Let me, give you the, let me give you what great preaching is. Number one, great preaching exalts the Savior. You see, great preaching is never about me. Great preaching is never about, look what I've accomplished. Great preaching is never about, well, let me tell you my thoughts. Let me stand on my soapbox for a little while. Great preaching magnifies and exalts the Savior. And if we're preaching Jesus, it's great preaching. If we're preaching uh, opinion, it starts to waffle a little bit there. Uh, Great preaching is preaching Jesus. So it exalts the Savior, number one. Number two, it edifies the saints. 
You see, when you come to church or when you hear the preaching of the Word of God, it ought to encourage you. It ought to challenge you. It ought to change you. It ought to shake you. It ought to say, hey, I want to do more for Christ. Boy, I love that Savior He's preaching about. And I want to make sure my life makes a difference for Him. I want to reach people. For, I, 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 want to, I want to do more. It edifies the saints. You know, Scripture tells us as believers we're supposed to edify one another. We're supposed to encourage one another. Uh, the church is a place we come uh, for, for partially for a reason for, of encouragement. Uh, we, we learn, we grow, and we get encouraged in the church. So preaching exalts the Savior. It's about Jesus, not about me. It's about Jesus, not about you. It's about Jesus, not about us and our thoughts. It exalts the Savior. Secondly, it edifies the saints. It edifies the saints. You ought to come to church and you ought to get encouraged. You ought to get challenged. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're watching online or if you're in our church and you're watching online uh, uh, and you don't go to our church or watch online, whatever the case may be, if you go to church and, and the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you, you might want to look at a different church because God should work in our midst. God should move in our midst. God should edify us in our midst. And if you're not getting that, fe that feeding and if you're not getting that edification, you might want to look at where you're at. It edifies the saints. Thirdly, the thirdfold purpose of this great preaching it exalts the Savior. It edifies the saints. Number three, it exposes sin. You see, preachers who never preach on sin are not preaching the whole counsel of God. Preachers who don't preach on sin are not following the example of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ called out sin. So did other preachers in Scripture. Uh, many of the Old Testament prophets especially called out sin. Uh, preaching, although it's not comfortable and although it doesn't necessarily make us feel good, Sin is sin. God punishes sin. We need to be aware of that. And sometimes sin has to be preached about just to kind of remind us of the fact we need to live for God. And if we don't, God chastens us as his children. Uh, what makes a great church? Well, we see the church in Jerusalem had a great purpose. They had a great preaching. Number three, number three, they had great power. They had great power. We see the power that was on display at Pentecost as Peter preached and those 3,000 souls were added to them. Oh, we see power all through the Bible. Uh, you see the power displayed of God at the Red Sea, how it, how it parted and the Israelites crossed on dry land and then it came down upon the Egyptian army as they chased them. You see the power of God on display at Daniel in the den of lions, the Hebrew boys in the, in the fiery furnace uh, turning water into wine, 5,000 plus be people being fed with, with five loaves and two fish, uh, sight being restored to the blind men, deaf men being healed, Lazarus among others being raised from the dead. You see the power of God all across the pages of Scripture. Folks, listen. The same power is available to us today. You see, we have the very same God of the Bible. Same power, same God available today. The problem is this, to get His power, there's usually a price to pay, and many of us aren't willing to pay that price. You see, the price that has to be paid to experience the power of God is twofold. First of all, it entails a clean life. It entails a clean life. Think about this, God can't fill a dirty vessel with Holy Spirit power. God can't fill a dirty vessel with Holy Spirit power. If I were to bring you a glass of water and there was junk floating in it because the cup was dirty, don't tell me you're going to drink it. If you pick up a cup or you go to the restaurant and they hand you a cup and you can see how dirty it is, you're going to ask for another cup. Think about that with God. How can I expect God to give me His power in my life so that I can uh, do things for the cause of Christ if my life is dirty? He's not going to pour His power into a dirty vessel. So if I want the power of God, I have to pay the price. I have to live a clean life. I have to live a life that's pleasing to Him. Secondly, it, it requires continually, continual asking. I have to continually ask for that power. Uh, see, great power comes through great prayer. The church at Jerusalem, you often find them meeting together, uh, not, not playing tiddly winks, not having a game night, uh, not having uh, an activity, although there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they're meeting together often in prayer. Great power requires great prayer. Uh, Luke chapter 11 the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. To them that ask Him. I want you to consider this morning with me uh, young David. And I often ask, why, why did God use David in such a great capacity? And of course, it calls David the man after God's own heart. But uh, why did He use him? And I, and I put down just three aspects of David uh, in his life that kind of encourages this area of great power. First of all, he had a willing heart. He had a willing heart. The Bible, again, calls him a man after God's own heart. He was willing to be used of God. Folks, by the way, God is more interested in our willingness than he is in our talent. 
He is more interested in us saying, yes, Lord, than, well, I can't, Lord, because I don't have this quality. Hey, if we just say yes to the Lord, he'll take care of the rest. David had a willing heart. Secondly, he had a wise head. He had a wise head. He waited on God to take care of things. You know, David knew he was going to be king of Israel, yet when, when, when Saul was in pursuit of him, he did not lash out at Saul and try to take the throne. Uh, David waited on the Lord. He had a wise head. The third thing you see about David is he had working hands. Working hands. You remember when the prophet Samuel came to Jesse's uh, family, and uh, they were trying to find out who was going to be the next king of Israel, who God was going to anoint. And remember they went through all the boys, and the last one, little David, Little David. And where was little David? He was out in the field taking care of the sheep. You realize out of eight boys of Jesse, only one was working? Now, again, they could have been and got called over. We don't, we don't know. But, but, but at this particular moment, only little David's out in the field working. He had working hands. He had working hands. You see, folks, the reality is this. When God recruits people to, infill, to, to endure with his power to do big things for him, he recruits workers uh, the areas, uh, your heart, your head, your hands. You see, I can't have the power of God if I don't have a clean heart. I won't get the power of God if I don't have a clever head. And I won't get the power of God if I want to have calloused hands. I've got to be willing to work for the cause of Christ. Uh, be a worker. Be willing. Be wise. Call upon Christ and ask continually for the power of God. Live a clean life. Power to serve God. The church had great power. Number four. Oh, before I give you this, let me, let me give you a little illustration. Um, the story is told of a rich farmer in Greece, and uh, he was about to die, and he told his sons, uh, he had two boys, and he told both of his sons, he said, out in my fields I have buried treasures. And before he could tell them which field, he, he passed away. The boys began to go out into all the fields and began to dig very fervently and turn up all the soil looking for the treasure. Weeks and weeks passed as they sought the treasure that their dad had hidden out in the fields. And uh, after uh, exhaustion and, and going through almost every field, turning it over, looking for this treasure, they looked at the time of year and realized it was planting season. And they looked at each other and said, you know what, we've, we've already kind of dug up and turned up all the fields. We might as well go ahead and plant the crops and then after harvest, uh, we'll come back and dig again and look for more of the, of the treasure. Well, they did that, and when harvest came, what they found out was this. The harvest came in greater abundance than it had in many, 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 many years. Because the soil had been so deeply turned by these boys as they looked for treasure. It was then that they awoke to the wisdom of their father. He had inspired them to go into the fields, to work, and to labor in the fields. And they found that there wasn't treasure hidden, but they obtained treasure in the harvest that they had. John chapter 4 verse 35 tells us, Say not yet, uh, there are four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Uh, we sing a song in our hymnal every now and then, Work for the night is coming. Listen, we need God's power. We need God's power. And we have to have willing hearts and working hands and a wise head to get out there and begin serving God and then allow His power to fill us to continue serving Him in a mighty way. Number four, I said they had great purpose, great preaching, and great power. Number four, they had great persecution. They had great persecution. Uh, those who serve God, history will show, uh, got persecuted. Uh, there was persecution involved with those who live for God. John 16, Jesus says to his disciples, In the world ye shall have tribulation. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Eleven of the twelve apostles were killed in violent ways. Early Christians had deep problems, uh, faced persecution like never before. Uh, when you go all out for God, and when you sell out for Him, and when you live that life that He wants you to live, and you're the Christian that you ought to be, let me just tell you, friend, and this might not be encouraging to you, but let me tell you, persecution's coming. Criticism is coming. Opposition is coming. See, here, here's what I love about Christ, though. Christ does not ask us to die for Him. He asks us to simply live for Him. Living for him involves paying a price, and many times that price is persecution. The Bible tells us all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you don't get some booze while you're out there, you're not really in the game. You're not really in the game because not everybody's going to cheer for you as you serve God. And sometimes it's going to be the most unexpected people who give you the booze. But if you're not getting some booze, you're not serving him right. 
And that's booze, B-O-O-S. Boo, not booze that way. But anyways, uh, I figured you figured that out. But uh, if you're not getting some, some persecution, if you're not getting some pushback, if you're not getting some criticism, I wonder, I wonder if we're doing things properly. They had great persecution. They had great persecution. And friend, let me just tell you, uh, the church has experienced persecution in the past. Uh, I believe there'll be more coming in the future. And we as a church need to be braced and ready for that and ready to serve God no matter what. And when the persecution comes, we say, I still will claim and cling to Jesus Christ. A persecution. Number five. Number five, they had great people. They had great people. Now all you're excited now. Yeah, he's talking about us finally. Great people. Uh, the early church, uh, the, you, do you realize in the early church, people, many people, they gave up their life's work to serve in that church. They gave up their, their hobbies, their jobs, their homes, their businesses, their wealth, and said, all to Jesus, I surrender. God, if you can use me in this church, use me. You have my life. Uh, some people actually did give their life. What a blessing it is to see dedicated people to God. People dedicated to the cause of Christ. People dedicated to the church. People dedicated to the Bible. People dedicated to the things of God. P people who sacrifice their time and their love and their, their money and their talents to do the work of God. What a blessing that is. And folks, if you want to have a great church, I'm just going to tell you this morning, it's got to be filled with great people. People that are willing to say, yes, Lord. People that are willing to sacrifice. People that are willing to be used of God in a mighty way. See, great people, not a great building, help make up a great church. We are the church, folks. And great people make a great church. Let me give this, uh, this last one here, number six. Number six. Actually, I have one more, seven. Uh, number six, they had great praise. They had great praise. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, and you look at verse uh, 46 and 40, 47, it says this, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They had great praise. Jesus did many miracles while he walked the face of this earth. And in doing those miracles, of course, uh, he received a lot of praise. Uh, he received a lot of, oh, wow, look what he did. Uh, by the way, Christian, can I just say this? We may not experience a, you know, a resurrection from the dead, or we may not experience the uh, feeding of the 5,000, but daily in our lives, God is doing miracles. Daily in our life, Jesus is working and doing miracles. We ought to daily praise him for his goodness in our lives. Do we like what's happening in some areas of our country? No. Do we like this whole COVID garbage that's going on? No. Uh, do we like the problems that we have to face and the circumstances we have to go through that are hard? No. But can we always praise God? Yes. He's always good. He always has His glory and our good and mine. Our ways are not His ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts. He knows what He's doing. We need to praise Him more. Praise God this morning. They had great praise. Psalm 107, David, five times in Psalm 107 says, Praise, or he says this, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Folks, if you just stopped and thought about this morning how good God is, his wonderful works to the children of men, we ought to stop daily in our lives, many times daily, and just stop for a minute, shut everything else off and, off and get out of our lives and just say, Hey, I just want to stop for a minute and praise God. I just want to praise you, Lord, for your goodness. Praise you for your wonderful salvation. Praise you for the blood that you shed for me. Praise you for rising from the dead. Praise you that you daily provide me with benefits and mercies anew every day. Praise you for food. Praise you for water. Praise you for my health. Praise you for my finances, my job. Praise you for my family. Praise you for everything. Hey, just praise God. See, a great church has great praise. We ought to praise God. Praise Him. Praise Him. All you little children, praise the Lord. I heard about one little uh, old lady. She was in a little country church, and they were sharing testimonies in the church service. And after listening to all the testimonies being given, this uh, the goodness of God, this little old lady stood up and she said, I don't have much of this world's goods. My health is not good. As a matter of fact, I only have two teeth, one on the top and one on the bottom. And she said, but praise God, they meet in the middle. They meet in the middle. You know, that certainly ought to be the attitude of Christians today. There is always something to be thankful for. A good positive attitude of gratitude will help make this a great church. Are you thankful this morning? 
Are you praising Him this morning? We ought to have great praise to God. We ought to praise Him for the gospel that we have. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. We get to share that as well. We ought to praise Him for His goodness in our lives. Praise God. Let me give you the last one now. Number seven. Number seven. They had great promises. They had great promises. I want you to look at the promises they possessed. First of all, they had the promise of heaven. Uh, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You see, this world is temporary. Uh, the dwelling place we're in is temporary. It's not permanent. We go through it for our 60, 70, 80 plus years, and then God takes us to our eternal home, if we know Him as our Savior, a place called heaven. They had the promise of heaven, and friends, let me tell you something today. So do we. We have the very same promise of heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Praise God for the promise of heaven. Uh, they had great promises. They had the promise of the Holy Spirit. We saw that earlier in the lesson. After you shall sure receive power, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. You shall sure receive power uh, and then you'll be witnesses unto me. We too have the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that the people that we look at in Scripture as great men of God and filled with the Holy Spirit, do you realize that, that nobody can have more of the Holy Spirit uh, than, than anybody else? We all have the same ability to have the Holy Spirit. The problem is, how much do we surrender our lives to Him for His control? And when He has more control, we, we, then, we then experience more power. And people look at us and say, well, how'd they get all the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's just, it's just submitting to Him. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the same promise. He will come into our lives. He's our comforter. Uh, he's our convictor. He's our guide. But he also is the one that then fills us with his power to serve him. They had the promise of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, they had the promise of real happiness. They had the promise of real happiness. Uh, think about that this morning. Uh, our world is looking for happiness today. They're looking for peace and joy. You realize that we have the giver of true happiness in Jesus Christ. We have happiness, real happiness. That same promise is given to us. You ever miserable down in the dumps and you're kicking rocks as you're walking, your head's hung low and you're uh, got the blues and oh, whoa, is me and nothing in life is right. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, listen, you have the promise of happiness. It's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have the promise of real happiness. There's thousands of promises in the Bible given to the believer. Claim those promises and realize those promises are great because they're from God. And if the church will look at those promises and claim those promises, it'll be part of making it a great church. The church at Jerusalem, I pointed out this morning, had seven great things. Those seven great things equaled together to make them a great church. They had a great purpose. They had great preaching. They had great power. They had a great persecution. Uh, they had great praise. And they had great promises. Folks, if we can analyze those things this morning, and we can apply those things to Calvary Baptist Church of Benson, Arizona, you know what we can have in God's eyes today? A great church. The world might never say it's great. We may never feel that it's great. But if we can apply these seven principles and say, hey, that's our church, God looks down from heaven and says, that is is a great church. That is a great church. Christian, I just want to challenge you this morning. Will you do your part in helping Calvary Baptist Church be a great church? Uh, we've seen the things laid out for us. Uh, we've seen the purpose. Will you help us follow through and fulfill our purpose? Uh, will you help us uh, 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 exalt the Savior and spread the Word of God? Uh, will, you, will, you, will you accept great preaching? And again, not because it's me as the pastor, but you accept great preaching from God's Word. No matter what it entails and what it covers and what it convicts us of, will we accept great preaching? Will we beg Him for His power? Will we beg Him for His power? Will we be willing to go through persecution? Because it's coming. Uh, will we be the great people that make up the great church? Will we offer Him great praise? And will we wait for and claim and receive great promises? Folks, if we can do that, we too can have a great church, just like the church in Jerusalem. And I want to challenge you this morning. Let's be a great church. Let's be a great church. Not for a pat on the back. Not for men's applause. Uh, not so that we make a name. But so that Christ can be magnified. And we can make an eternal difference in the temporary world in which we live. Christ is coming back soon, folks. I, I believe with all my heart. Let's make a difference for him while we can. Let's be a great church. Father, 
Lord, this morning I pray you'll take what's been said and use it, Lord, in our lives. I know this was an unusual uh, service because we weren't in person. It's just recorded online, but uh, we've done it before, and if we have to do this again in the, in the future, we definitely will. We thank you for the technology. Uh, but, Lord, we just ask you to help make Calvary Baptist Church a great church. Help us each to do our part. And, Lord, maybe those who are watching that are part of another church, help them to take these truths and use it in their church. Uh, Lord, if there's people that are watching that uh, don't go to church at all, Lord, we invite them to come to ours, and we invite them to be a part of a great church and help us make it great. And, Father, we just pray that you use the thoughts that have been shared this morning to encourage and challenge the believer. Uh, Lord, use these mes this message in our hearts and in our lives uh, to make us more of what we should be for the cause of Christ. Help us, Lord, to, again, make a difference here in this world in which we live. May we stand for Christ and promote the Savior and be what we need to be for Christ, I pray. Help us to uh, push through the persecution. Help us to praise you. Lord, just help us to be what we need to be, I pray. Uh, bless the message now and use it in our lives and use it in our church. Strengthen the church, Lord, we pray. We thank you again for all that you've done, and we ask you to bless the remainder of our day. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We appreciate it. If you don't have a home church, we'd like to invite you out to our church, 2300 West Calvary Lane uh, here in Benson, exit two, uh, 302. Love to have you come visit us sometime, and uh, we'll keep you posted as far as services. Tonight's service will be online as well, but uh, we will let you know for the rest of the week here just very soon. So God bless you again. Thank you for joining us. And again, if you need something, don't hesitate to call the church office. We love you, and uh, look forward to having a great week. God bless you.